Hello, I'm Jeremy Strick, director of the Nasher Sculpture Center. Welcome to day three of the Nasher Prize Dialogues Graduate Symposium. This year, dedicated to the work of the 2020 Nasher Prize laureate, Michael Rakowitz. While the symposium is usually hosted here in Dallas at the Nasher Sculpture Center, due to the unique circumstances of the, of the pandemic, this year we are hosting it virtually. But the virtual format allows students from around the country and Europe to present their papers, as well as more people to watch and participate in the program than ever before. We're delighted that so many will get to learn more about the compelling work of Michael Rakowitz. I want to express gratitude to the many generous sponsors of this event. Marguerite Hoffman and Thomas Lentz, Elizabeth Redleaf, Alana and Adrian Sada, Albertino Cisneros and Juan Pascual, and Lisa Dawson and Thomas Marstad. Thank you for making it possible for us to further the academic research on this remarkable artist. Today, we'll we hear from graduate students Sarah Bernhardt from University of Oxford and Amalia Nangeroni from Ca' Foscara University of Venice, Italy. And steering the conversation this week will be Dr. Nada Shabut, an expert on the work of Michael Rakowitz, as well as a close friend of the artist. Nada Shabut is a professor of art history and the coordinator of the Contemporary Arab and Muslim Cultural Studies Initiative at the University of North Texas, Denton, Texas, USA. She is the founding president of the Association for Modern and Contemporary Art for the, from the Arab world, Iran, and Turkey. Shabut was the project advisor for the Saudi National Pavilion, Venice Biennale 2019. She's the author of Modern Arab Art, Formation of Arab Aesthetics, co-editor with Salwa Migdadi of New Vision, Arab Art in the 21st Century, and co-editor of Modern Art in the Arab World, Primary Documents. Shabut has been curator of many exhibitions and the recipient of various awards, including the Presidential Excellency Award, University of North Texas, the American Academic Research Institute in Iraq Fellowship, MIT Visiting Assistant Professor, and Fulbright Senior Scholar Program. Dr. Shabut, thank you so much for your dedication to the 2020 Nasher Prize Graduate Symposium, and thanks to all for watching. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our third session today. Our topic for the day is dealing with trauma, healing, and reappearing. We have two speakers who actually join us from, um, from Europe. Our first speaker is Sarah Bernhard, who is a researcher and artist based in London and a student at the University of Oxford. Um, our second, and, and she is joining us from London. And our second uh, presenter today is Amalia Nangeroni, who is an art historian and an independent curator and currently um, also affiliated with the Cafascori University in Venice. She also, um, uh, where she is completely, uh, she is currently completing her master's in contemporary art his history. She joined us today from Torino in, um, in Italy as well. I want to remind everyone that uh, you can um, send us our, your questions um, for the uh, portion of the Q&A after the presentations. You can send them in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm sure you have instructions of um, how to send them to us. I would like now to introduce, um, uh, give the floor to Sarah Bernhardt, uh, whose paper is titled Participation and Promise, The Culinary Interventions of Michael Rakowitz. Sarah, go ahead, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Participation and Promise, The Culinary Interventions of Michael Rakowitz. Over the last two decades, Michael Rakowitz has produced some of the most memorable and emotive works of contemporary art. Critically acclaimed within the art world, his practice is as likely to be featured within mainstream news articles as it is reviewed in cultural publications. Whilst war and politics are so often at the heart of his practice, 
they are expressed with a genuine sensitivity and complexity that does nothing to limit the poignant gut punch many feel on encountering such work. Indeed, this encounter is crucial to appraising Rakowitz's work. Like the majority of current conceptual artists, his works appear in private galleries as well as museums and nonprofit institutions. But Rakowitz's long standing commitment to intervention and collaboration sets him apart from many of his contemporaries and encourages a deeper academic response in ethics or epistemology as readily as it does aesthetics. In light of this assertion, it seems perhaps reductive to state that this paper will be concerned with the relevance of eating and consumption in Rakowitz's practice. But by citing his food-based works within a wider anthropological discourse, the healing aspects of his work can be newly explored and illuminated. So, where is it that we find food in Rakowitz's work? Most obvious are the large-scale projects from 2003 and 2004, which mark the formal in initiation of Enemy Kitchen and return. The following decade saw Spoils in 2011, as well as the cookbook published last year, A House with a Date Palm Will Never Starve. Alongside these performative works, we should also add The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, May the Obdurate Foe Not Be in Good Health, May the Arrogant Not Prevail and Rise, Although there is a distinction between sculptural works made from food packaging and more performative works that involve the literal preparation and consumption of food, this paper will focus on the first three interventions Rakowitz initiated. The outlier here is perhaps the intervention rise, which relies on the gallery visitor inhaling the scent of food without necessarily seeing it. Aside from its obvious role in sustaining life, something that can be quantified at a microcosmic individual level, food has an equally complex role in healing that stretches more easily into metaphor, community and abstraction. This is a topic as readily found in the humanities as it is the sciences. This paper defines healing quite loosely as a reconciliation of the meaning an individual ascribes to distressing events within their perception of wholeness as a person. In other words, a transcendence of suffering or the considered improvement to a mental or physical state. In Rakowitz's work, there is a combined emphasis. One, to provide shared meals and thereby promote cross-cultural dialogue as a social remedy. And secondly, to use food itself as a metaphor for the ability to heal and nourish. This paper will argue that although both methods have a valid role in healing individuals and communities, Rakowitz's culinary interventions are also unique in that they show audiences the difficulties and complications in doing so. Enemy Kitchen, first initiated in 2003 as a culinary intervention, is described on Rakowitz's website modestly as a cooking workshop, which of course it is, but it goes further than that. By compiling Baghdadi recipes with his Iraqi Jewish mother and teaching them to multiple public audiences, often school students, Rakowitz seeks to, and here I'm quoting Rakowitz himself, open up a new route through which Iraq can be discussed. In this case, through the most familiar of cultural staples, nourishment. Iraqi culture is virtually invisible in the US beyond the daily news. An enemy kitchen seizes the possibility of cultural visibility to produce an alternative discourse. The obvious question arising from this is how effective is food as an instigator of alternate discourse? And how might healing be enabled by such a method? The long and ubiquitous history of gastro diplomacy makes a convincing case for shared meals as one of the most delicately persuasive instruments for peace and communication whereby the heads of state or representatives share a highly choreographed meal that reflects the adeptness of the host, and more often than not, a menu that reflects some of the history and traditions of the guest. Consider then the link to download the Enemy Kitchen Iraqi Fried Chicken recipe on Rakowitz's website. Opening the document, it becomes clear that it resulted from a conversation that Hayashim one of the students at Hudson Guild Community Center had with Rakowitz. 
and I'm going to quote from the conversation. Do Iraqis make southern fried chicken? I answered no. To my knowledge, there was nothing like it in Iraqi cuisine. Well then, let's invent it. The resulting recipe stands as a testament to the eight weeks of collaboration in a way that simply posting the original taught Iraqi recipes would not. The enthusiasm of Hayashim to offer his family's fried chicken recipe to be literally fused with Iraqi flavors is a clear celebration of the joy and delight to be found in multiculturalism. It is also symbolically beautiful. To counter the small number of Iraqi restaurants in America, Rakowitz and his mother become the de facto representatives of Iraqi Jewish cuisine when they share their heritage. The healing qualities of communal dining have already been mentioned, but there is another dynamic at play here, an emphasis on the maternal. By relaying his mother's Iraqi Jewish recipes to American children, Rakowitz adopts a familiar mode of communication. This isn't just about visibility or pedagogy, but is markedly allegorical. While this intervention might not heal a generation's misunderstandings or reluctance to engage with a culture different to their own, Hayashim and his peers have Rakowitz's permission to create something else, together. A few months after Rakowitz taught students of Hudson Guild Community Center, Enemy Kitchen took a different physical form as a food truck in Chicago. Rather than Rakowitz teaching alone, Iraqi chefs would work with veterans from the Iraq war who in turn worked as sous chefs or served the food. This scaling up maintains the ethos of the earlier iteration to foster dialogue across communities and to give his mother's recipes metaphorical form. However, by working with immigrants and veterans, there is the unavoidable confrontation of past trauma. For those that left Iraq to make America their home and look back to a country still at war, for those that were part of the armed forces, and for American citizens who had varying levels of conflict awareness. If we can talk separately of psychological healing and somatic healing, it is far harder to quantify remedial developments to the mind than the body. This subjectivity means that it is impossible to evaluate Rakowitz's work in terms of its efficacy, even with first-hand accounts or interviews. What we can ascertain is the repetitive and exhaustive framing and repositioning of his work allows all those that come into contact with it the ability to reconcile themselves with the difficult past and, of course, the option to consume a more benign present. An argument against such a neat reading of Rakowitz's work is that by generating the specter of historic trauma or using food as a panacea for such loss, it mitigates the gravity of the situation. However, this ignores two vital points. The first, summarized aptly by Rakowitz, is that he would often hear Americans say that the Iraq war ended in 2011, but it continues for the Iraqi people. I'm adamant about making that understood and visible. If anything, Enemy Kitchen does not lessen the gravity of the situation, but challenges a popular assumption that a war fought far, far away is fixed and resolved by state prescribed dates. Secondly, by working with veterans, Rakowitz highlights the other unseen casualty, the effects still wrought on the military returning home. Whilst not an explicit critique of post-traumatic stress, it is worth noting that domestic arrangements many veterans are left with. A research paper from 2014 found that food insecurity among war veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan was close to 27%, notably higher than the comparative US population figure of 14.5. Indeed, very low food security among veterans was in fact double the national rate. Again, it is impossible and perhaps unethical to draw conclusions about how effective this is at healing. Talking about his earlier work, Parasites, that provide temporary shelters for the homeless, Rakowitz concedes that they can do little to address the societal problems that make Parasite necessary in the first place. In a way, this is also true of Enemy Kitchen, in that even if it continues to be radically scaled up, it is unlikely to fix the global and endemic structural inequalities at their roots. However, what this culinary intervention does in the service of healing is to provide, in microcosm, 
each social grouping with tools and agency to heal together. In comparison to Enemy Kitchen, Spoils also reflects on the immunity of social groups to process or engage with the consequences of war, but is less concerned with imparting intimate personal heritage and directly conjures the power of the state and gross political upheaval. Collaborating with the chef Kevin Lasco in New York, diners visiting the Park Avenue restaurant in the fall of 2011 could order venison on a bed of Iraqi date syrup and tahini with a less mouth-watering proviso. They were served on looted plates from Saddam Hussein's palaces. The plates themselves, predictably regal in appearance and somewhat banally made by Wedgwood and Buridard, had been sourced from two sellers on eBay, an American soldier serving in Iraq and a refugee now based in Michigan. The provenance of the Wedgwood China has the added history of belonging to Iraq's last monarch, Faisal II, assassinated in 1958. Where Enemy Kitchen provided employment for oft-neglected groups, Spoils pushes the message of visibility to a much more privileged cohort without this exact altruistic mechanism. However, this is not a piece of art without healing imperative, nor is it solely reliant on visibility to do so. Instead, Spoils recalls that famous quote by Brilla Savarin, tell me what you eat and I shall tell you what you are. There's also a later rendition by the writer Norma Clark, we are what we are seen to eat. To this, we might also add, show us what you are prepared to eat off and let us see your stance on ethics. Whilst many diners were outraged and the restaurant received official complaints, there were many who ordered the dish despite initial reluctance or distaste. The coda to spoils was in fact both more formal and more definite. Nuri al-Maliki, then serving as Prime Minister of Iraq, requested the repatriation of Saddam Hussein's crockery in December 2011. Rakowitz documented this transaction on video and described it as a sign of possibility that Iraq is perhaps moving towards an end to sy systematic amnesia regarding its societal problems. For the citizens of Iraq and indeed the diners of the Park Avenue restaurant, Perhaps this, perhaps this offered a reconciliation of sorts towards distressing events. At the minimum, it demanded a formal acknowledgement for everyone involved. Whilst in theory, sharing food between different cultural social groups should work to establish or maintain positive relationships. In reality, this is predictably more complicated. As food is an unquestionable necessity to all human life, the experience of consumption is always correlated with patterns of power, knowledge and environment. In terms of migration, these dynamics can still be subtle, but are pushed far closer to the surface. Leaving aside negative responses, reluctance to engage with, and systematic racism that still sadly shapes experience of food and immigration, the embrace of multicultural food is not without problems. In his work on Lebanese food culture in Australia, the anthropologist Gassan Hajj warns that the celebration of migrant dishes constitutes a gastro-tourism that does not always necessitate real engagement between ethnic groups. In, in essence, a multiculturalism without migrants. Other issues that wholly negate food and consumption as healing processes are the exploitation of migrant labor in the food and catering industry and the risks that even well-meaning anthropological studies carry by defining ingredients and meals as sourced from specific regions or attributed to certain groups, as in our food from here and your food from there, they are in essence treating migrant identities as singular and fixed. Emma Jane Abbotts pointedly asks, who does the work of reproducing migrant identities and mediating between host and home? And to what extent does this change over time? An interesting question, especially in terms of Rakowitz's practice. Who indeed is this mediator? Conservatively, we might ascribe this role to Rakowitz himself as the instigator of these culinary interventions, especially in his work return. In 2004, Rakowitz initiated another artwork that examined the diasporic experience for Iraqis living in America. Although its gestation period in history stretches back into the middle of the 20th century, when Rakowitz's grandfather and family were exiled from Iraq. 
Leaving in 1946, we find Nisim Isaac David later running an import and export business in New York. Named Davidson's & Co., the business shut in the 60s to be reopened by Rakowitz in 2004 in Queens, later in the Bronx, and in 2006 in Brooklyn. The company in its first iteration functioned symbolically as a Dropbox and grew holistically to a full-fledged packaging center and sorting facility. For the Iraqi community, many of whom might have found themselves in Nassim's position, in a very different landscape and wondering about the connection to a country they left, it served as a benevolent act where packages could be sent to Iraqi recipients free of charge. The project later expanded again to function as a food store for Iraqi foodstuffs. As one would expect with Rakowitz's work, the setting itself is evidence of an exhaustive attempt to render complex histories with all that is available. Different types of dates were set out on a table to be purchased, and around them evidence of Iraq's turbulent past. Various brands of date syrup originating from Iraq, but purposefully mislabeled to avoid import restrictions in the US were displayed as were various Iraqi flags showing changes to nationhood, and a plethora of paperwork documenting the fate of the original ton of dates Rakowitz had attempted to import. The majority of the dates never made it to the shop, having been stopped repeatedly after leaving Baghdad and beginning to ruin in the heat. The solution to this was twofold. For the start of the project, Rakowitz relied on Californian dates, which can be traced back to original imported specimens from Iraq, and later, a modest 10 boxes compared to the original ton, arrived via DHL to the US. It is easy to read the dates metaphorically for the plight of Iraqi refugees and migrants attempting to move to the US, and the pathos generated might remedy static or unkind attitudes towards those affected. However, it is also worth looking at the intersection of memory and taste to evaluate how healing might take place. In his work on food and memory, the anthropologist John D. Holtzman asks, which kind of memories does food have the particular capacity to inscribe? And are there other ways that food might be implicated in conscious or unconscious forgetting? Briefly acknowledging the ubiquity of the Proustian Madeleine across scholarship and literature, it is the sensuousness of food that strongly ties it to memory and of course emotion. When Rakowitz was being interviewed during the arrival of the Iraqi dates, he was asked why he hadn't eaten one. Therefore, Iraqis in exile, he said. They weren't for him, they were for a lot of people. For diasporic Iraqis in America, not only consuming the dates, but seeing their legitimate labeling as product of Iraq, rather than furtively attributed to another Middle Eastern country, grants them not only visibility, but agency. A further argument can be made that this healing mechanism extends to those who might not have tasted Iraqi dates, either in America or Iraq. Holtzman makes a distinction between nostalgia as the re-encounter of a lived past and nostalgia for something yet to be experienced. For an American audience encountering the work, partaking in such ritual or experiencing any sort of loss could be viewed as exploitative or even voyeuristic. And there is a considerable amount of literature that suggests that eating ethnic food bound to form a sort of false colonial nostalgia or eating the other. In the case of return, there are several contextual factors that challenge this. First, by encouraging a wide participation in the work, Rakowitz focuses return simultaneously on education and research alongside empathy. It is impossible to remain impartial to Iraq's history while purchasing or consuming the dates, or even casually perusing the store. Secondly, the length of time that Iraq has suffered from international war and sectarian violence has meant that many who left, left a long time ago and have not been able to return. Thus, it is perfectly possible, as well as very sobering, to think that for at least a generation of expatriates, an Iraqi date labelled as such is a perfectly new phenomenon. Finally, what Return does not shy away from is the conditions in Iraq that shape the work itself. Iraq's recent history has had dramatic implications for the food and nutrition available to its populace. Over three quarters of Iraq's landmass is unsuitable for agriculture, owing to both climate and soil composition. Moreover, decades of conflict that stretch almost non-stop from the Iraq-Iran war in the 80s 
Gulf War in the 90s, an American invasion from 2008, has left the country frequently reliant on imports to feed its population. It is hard to imagine the distress felt as the UN applied several years of heavy sanctions to what was already a humanitarian catastrophe. In her study of Iraqi Jewish communities in Quebec, Norma Bauman Joseph focuses on the ritual consumption of tabit. Understood as the quintessential Sabbath food for Iraqi Jews, she noted that tabit began to be consumed in this community far more frequently and outside of his designated Sunday, Saturday mealtime. While she argues that immigrants might quickly lose their language of origin, cooking and eating often remain steadfast in the face of significant change in environment. And in this specific example, it became a way for the community to engage with the lost past. In addition, it is worth considering that, certainly in America, in the public sphere, ethnic food is often a palatable form of multiculturalism, in contrast with the conformity expected, demanded, or even legislated in areas such as language and clothing. This remains largely true across the Western world. There is, of course, no real culinary equivalent to France's Burka ban in 2010, or language-based immigration assessment, such as routine in England and Australia. Is this because the availability of a globalized menu is hard to radicalize and make threatening? It could also be because food is simultaneously such a private and public activity in terms of sourcing, preparing, and consuming food. These arguments broadly suggest that for immigrant communities in America, ethnographic food histories can be preserved at a local level and give agency to groups to maintain a historically validated identity. But what happens when a key ingredient to a nation's history cannot be obtained? Rakowitz's stress on the difficulty of sourcing Iraqi dates goes to the heart of this. While many ethnic restaurants and food businesses have flourished in cosmopolitan cities in the US, the ability to import certain ingredients needed in the creation of Iraqi family meals, let alone businesses and restaurants, curtails both personal ritual and communal enterprise. If partaking in these processes is vital for communities to heal, both to offer reconciliation for past trauma and to improve lived experience in the present and future, then Rakowitz offers us a nuanced way of understanding this relationship to history. Claude Levi Strauss described our relationship to food as one of the few universal truths of human activity. And it remains one of the most illuminating and rich sources of insight into human behavior, history and experience. What Rakowitz achieves in his culinary interventions is to consistently set in motion both localized initiatives to enable healing in communities with the potential to increase in scale and reach and the simultaneous dedication to cross-cultural dialogue. More than this, his work also offers a nuanced approach to the difficulties in enacting such change. And while there is a modesty and embrace of the limits to these interventions, Rakowitz's dedication and commitment ensure that the projects itself, themselves do not get shut down for uninteresting reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this deep look and in research into the culinary experience and, and uh, food. Um, I would like now to give the floor to our second uh, speaker, who is also the last paper presented um, in this graduate symposium. Amalia Nanjaroni will um, present her paper, Michael Rakowitz's Project of Reappearing. Amalia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Shabut, for the introduction. And thanks to everyone who made this event possible in this challenging year. So my research is about Michael Rakowitz's projects of reappearing. Reappearance is a fundamental notion for interpreting Rakowitz's artistic practice. In this presentation, I will analyze in depth the Angong project, The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, and the work What Does We Rise, in which the artist, through the reappearance of lost or stolen artifacts or monuments, face the theme of the destruction of a cultural heritage and consequently the trauma experienced by people who survived events of iconoclasm, liberty style, looting, and any other forms of disappearance. In this project, 
Rakowitz presents a series of sculptural works which simultaneously fuse antiquity and contemporaneity. In fact, through a complex operation of translation, the artist recovers the images of lost ancient artifacts, monuments, or books, and he makes them appear in a new materiality. Therefore, it is not a process that aims at imitating the lost works. Rather, it focuses on the evocation of the past. When on the occasion of an interview, Ivona Blatswick asked Rakowitz about rebuilding the monument as a recurrent motif in his work, the artist stated, I understand this project not as the rebuilding or reconstructing, but as reappearing. They can only ever be ghosts of the originals, and like all good ghosts, their job is to hunt. I find this statement particularly inspiring. Also, in many other interviews, Rakowitz links the concept of reappearing to these figures that become visible again through the materiality of his works. These in entities who survived the loss of the medium to which they once belonged appear to hunt the present. I consider this assumption especially significant in the light of the way in which Abi Warburg defined the history of art as the history of images, i.e. a ghost story for adults. In fact, Georges Didi Huberman has unearthed the thoughts of the German art historian about the concept of image as phantom. According to him, the image is what survives from the past and returns to disturb the gaze, since the history is a tense story that has, as its subject, an unstable dynamic of latencies and awakenings, a wriggling and inextricable tangle of times. In this sense, it could be said that Rakowitz draws from art history involving its phantoms. The images of lost ancient artifacts, monuments, and books appear to hunt the present, revealing themselves in a new materiality that in Rakowitz's works is always connotated by multiple meanings related to contemporary times. In fact, Specifically, in the project The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist and in the work What Does We Rise, different semiotic systems are present. They become visible through the iconographic references, the materials used, and the display choices adopted by Rakowitz. These systems interact with each other, revealing a co-presence of past and present that allows the reconfiguration of the meaning of both. Hence, this implies a revision of the past and, at the same time, a new awareness about the present. In this regard, I see a remarkable connection with the concept of preposterous history conceived by the cultural theorist and artist Mike Bau. She wrote about it in relation to the revisions of the Baroque art into contemporary artworks. According to her, Art is an active reworking, and the artwork performed by later images obliterates the older images as they were before. The past does not determine the present. Instead, the present determines the originality of the past and its contemporary value. This reversed direction of historical reflection is exactly what she means by preposterous history. She wrote, this reversal, which puts what came first chronologically, pre, behind, post, its later recycling as an after effect, as is what she called a preposterous history. It is a way of doing history that carries productive uncertainties and illuminating highlights, a vision of how to revision the past from today's perspective. In my opinion, this concept is particularly interesting when put in relation to the way Michael Rakowitz deals with history. In the project, the invisible enemy should not exist, and in the work, what does we rise? The object of revision is not just a question of language, a style, a migration of iconographic motives from the past, but of entire work of art as systems and functions of a cultural imaginary. 
But not only that, the subject of the revision is also the reception of ancient artifacts, monuments, and books over the centuries, particularly in contexts where the cultural imperialism of the West has dominated. If, according to Bao, it is the present that determines the originality of the past and its contemporary value, Rakowitz's works call for reflection about how Western museums has created their itineraries to tell their own visions of the culture. In Rakowitz's works, the critical position regarding the dispersion of the cultural heritage that occurred in the name of the archaeology and the history of art is evident. At the same time, these artworks remind that this, it was precisely the value that the West attributed to certain works, whether they were ancient artifacts, monuments, or literary works, to be the cause of their destruction. As a consequence, these considerations then lead to investigate the role that the project The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist and the work What Does We Rise play in the narration of the history today and the role of, of Rakowitz himself as storyteller. In this regard, I consider interesting also the comparison between artist and historian that Georges Didier Huberman expressed in his book, L'image brûle, The Image Burns. He wrote, the artist and the historian would therefore have a common responsibility, namely to make tragedy visible in culture, so as not to separate it from its history, but also culture in tragedy, so as not to separate it from its memory. In my opinion, this statement is particularly relevant in relation to Rakowitz's practice, because in his works, artistic creation and historical narration coexist and that it is particularly evident in the narrative drawings that accompany his artistic projects. These works are truly expressions of tragedy in culture because linked to dramatic events of history. And still, they are texts of culture created in times of tragedy, which offer new interpretations of the past. And at the same time, they create new narratives by intervening in the memory of the observer. So let's talk about the artworks in more detail. The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist is an evolving project or reappearance of lost, looted, or destroyed objects. It unfolds as an intricate narrative about the artifacts stolen from the National Museum of, of Baghdad in the aftermath of the US invasion in 2000, 2003. The current status of their whereabouts and the series of events surrounding the invasion, plundering, and related protagonists. The centerpiece of the project is an ongoing series of sculptures that represent an attempt to reconstruct the looted archaeological artifacts. Using reference material from the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago's Lost Treasures of Iraq database of thousands of objects, as well as images posted on the Interpol's website, each sculpture is carefully constructed on one-to-one -one scale of the lost artifact, using Arab newspapers and detritus from food packages that circulate in the diasporic Arab community in the US. In the Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, comprehensive projects, the materials are fragments of cultural visibility being enlisted to make visible things that are invisible. They are vector of a multitude of messages and their provenance is a key information. In fact, the everyday objects included in the artworks imply the reflection on Arab diaspora and illuminates a range of social political issues. In the exhibition space, the sculptures are installed in an unusual museum, placed on tables reproducing a scale modern of the Aibu Shapu, the ancient processional way in Babylon, which means the invisible enemy should not exist. Each artifact is accompanied by a museum label listing the museum number, provenance, and other identifying facts. 
However, the narrative information about each lost object is replaced with quotes by Iraqi archaeologists, American military commanders, and others reacting to the looting. The resulting is a fragmented dialogue that spreads across the work's presentation. Other elements of the project take the form of drawings and short and written texts, which provide a narrative framework to the war in Iraq and the looting of the National Museum in Baghdad. Different protagonists appear in this narration, but the most important is Dr. Donnie George, the museum director who led continuous efforts to recover the stolen artifacts. Part of the Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist project is also May the Arrogant Not Prevail. It is a scaled down reconstruction of the still standing replica of the Ishtar Gate made by Iraqi government in the 50s, which served as one of the most popular photo backdrops for US soldiers during the Second Gulf War in Iraq. The monumental installation is built out of plywood and wooden beams and clad with newspapers and color correct packaging of Arabic foodstuff found in Berlin, where the work was presented for the first time. Even this work is accompanied by a series of narrative drawings, which Rakowitz narrates historical facts that highlights the genesis of the work. Thanks to these references, the figures that are represented in Rakowitz's gate are understood as linked to those depicted on the original Ishtar gate and reproduced on its reconstructions in Iraq and at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Thus, they appear lions, bulls, and the Mushus dragoons, the mythological creatures, considered sacred to Ishtar, the Akkadian goddess of fertility, love, sex, and war. On the basis of the information included in the drawings, the viewer also becomes aware about the story of the original Ishtar gate of the ancient Babylon. Through Go's Ark ran the processional way of Aibur Shaku, was a secondary translation is May the Arrogant Not Prevail. It was excavated by a German archaeologist at the beginning of the 20th century who transported it to Berlin where it was installed at the Pergamon Museum. In this way, Western cultural supremacy is questioned, which for centuries has allowed the expropriation of works of art from numerous countries. The process of dislocation of the works has generated the decontextualization that implies a new writing of their history. Part of the invisible enemy should not exist projects are also the rooms of Northwestern Palace of Nimrud. They are a series of sculptural reliefs created in relation to the walls of a banquet courtyard within King Ashurnasipal II palace built in Kalu, the ancient Assyrian city of Nimrud in the current Iraq, destroyed by ISIS in 2015. The rock of its rooms present papier mache panels which follow the architectural layout of the original. They are made using packaging from North Iraqi products, cut and shaped like vividly colored fabric. The installation of the works manifests a rhythm of fullness and emptiness. In fact, in the exhibition space, the artist exhibits only the effigy of the panels destroyed in 2015, leaving vacant spaces for the still existed reliefs which are now displayed in the most prestigious museums of the Western world since the archaeologists removed them in the 20th century. Empty spaces are visibly a larger portion of the installation, in so much as only one third of the total reliefs have been destroyed by ISIS since 400 of the 600 originals were removed during archaeological expeditions. The gaps among the reliefs acknowledge the continued history of displacement in Iraq, creating what the artist call, calls a palimpsest of different moments of removal. Even in this work, the labels in the exhibition space don't provide information about the reliefs as typical labels in a museum do, but they include comments from archaeologists, journalists, and historians.
Part of the Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist project is also the Lamassu. It is a work conceived by the artist after the destruction of the sculpture of the protective deity Lamassu, the Assyrian human-handed winged bull created around 700 BC that once graced the entrance to the Nergal Gate that led to Nineveh, Iraq, claimed by ISIS in 2015. Rakovic's sculpture stood proud on the Fort Plint in Trafalgar Square, London, where it remained for two years until 2020. The placement of the work itself was particularly significant because the London Square represents the center of what was once the colonial metropolis of the British Empire. It thus refers to the archaeological campaigns promoted by the in the Mesopotamian area that removed the ancient artifacts from the original sites to place them at the London British Museum, among other cultural venues in the West. Besides Rakowitz, Lamastu stands out for its bright colors given the ma by materials the artist used which are in contrast to the pale stone of the original sculpture. In fact, the artwork is composed by thousands of empty date syrup scans from an Iraqi industry brought to its knees during the Second Gulf War and the recycled packaging from Middle Eastern foodstuff stored in the West. Therefore, the sculptural reconstruction that simultaneously fuses antiquity and modernity. That's the story of the damage inflicted by the war on Iraqi culture and cultivation. The reincarnated Lamassu, in this sense, cries out against the multiple contemporary forces that enact the catastrophic liquidation of human lives, of ecological equ equilibrium, and of ag agricultural inheritance, as well as a monumental history of imperial dispossession. What Does We Rise is a site-specific installation commissioned for Documenta 13 and conceived for the Friedericiano Museum. It recreates books from the State Library of Essex Castle that were destroyed in a fire in, in the German Museum during a bombing by the British Royal Air Force in 1941. With the help of stone carvers from the Afghanistan and Italy, Rakowitz remade these lost volumes out of travertine quarried in the Bamiyan Valley, where two monumental 6th century sandstone Buddhas were dynamited by the Taliban in 2001. In the exhibition space, they are displayed among with fragments of destroyed Buddhas of Bamiyan and the books burned during the bombing of the Friedericiano. Even in this installation, the museological display is significant. The fragments of Buddhas are housed in protective showcases, while the books recreated from Bamiyang stone are exhibited on glass tables with wooden feet. Rakovitz wrote directly on the glasses with a paint marker information regarding the artifacts. So in this way, his handwriting is opposed to the typical printed museum label. The written information is about the story of the artifacts, but also includes quotes that create moments of tension, like the one by Taliban Mullah Mohammed Omar regarding his reasons to destroy the Buddhas. Again, the reference to the West is not blameless. As well as an installation, What Does We Rise was also a workshop held in Bamiyan itself as part of the Afghan seminars series organized by Documenta 13. Along with a sculpture and a restorer, the artist led the workshop that taught a group of local students the art of stone carving that had been part of the heritage of the Azerayat region for centuries. The aim of the project was to recuperate the traditional skill of stone carving. In this way, the cultural trauma provoked by the loss of Buddhas of Bamiyan, as well as the volumes burned in the Second World War at the Fridericianum, is addressed through the creation of culture. As the artist said, acknowledgement and accountability are important to a process of healing. 
Following this detailed analysis of the artworks, in the light of all the aspects resulting from the analysis of science present, the translation of a cultural drama provoked in the history by different forms of disappearance turns out to be a central theme for Rakowitz. In this regard, I would like to return to the concept of preposterous history to add a new level of interpretation to the Rakowitz projects of reappearing. By transferring the Bals concept of doing history into Rakowitz artistic practice, I propose to consider that in these analyzed works, the object of revision is also the past of destruction that caused cultural trauma to the people who survived moments of iconoclasm or libricide. In these works, the trauma is embodied since the ghosts from the past appear through the images that take place in new media. This particular conduct of the image was questioned by the art historian Hans Belting, who is known for his anthropology of images theory. According to him, the images are like nomads because they move from one medium to another. The meaning of an image becomes accessible not only by considering its iconic aspects, but also by taking into account the factors of the medium and the body. This triad, image, medium, body, is the basis of his theory. The medium is the tool through which images are transmitted and are hosted, and the body is the element that allows their perception. The concept of the image, on the other hand, is more problematic in definition. He wrote, the images are neither on a wall or on a screen, nor just in the mind. They do not exist in themselves, but they happen. They take place there, whether it is moving images or static images. They happen thanks to transmission and perception. And following these considerations, the concept of image as phantom of Warburg is still intriguing in relation to the notion of ghosts in Rakowitz's projects of reappearing. The concept of the medium is actually relevant in Rakowitz's works. Previously, I analyzed in depth the importance of the materials and their meanings according to their provenance. Furthermore, his display choices and his museographic references are essential to address the perception of the artworks by the viewer. On the other hand, the body, the mind of the viewer is significant too because it configures the memory of the lost artifacts through the mediation of Rakowitz's works. According to Yuri Lotman, the founder of the Semiotics of Culture, the memory is not like a generator that reproduces the past, that generates a conceptualized reality that the mind transfers to the past. But he wrote, memory is the tool for thinking in the present. And this is, in my opinion, what happens in Rakowitz's works. The original artworks, monuments, and books will no longer be perceived as before. Their traumatic connotation, their reference to their destruction or damage are translated into something different through a new awareness. Coming to this consideration, it is the way in which the artist acts on memory that makes possible a new writing of history and different versions of culture. In conclusion, in the light of these considerations, the project The Invisible Enemy Shouldn't Exist and What Does We Rise Work are projects of reappearing that act on collective memory. Ghosts of past images haunt the present to shake a reaction. The trauma suffered as a result of all kinds of disappearance are dealt with as in a healing process. And this aims to create a new writing of history that implies a greater awareness of the present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amalia, for this, this, uh, this deep reading of um, uh, Rakowitz's work. Actually, both papers just greatly complemented each other and open up a whole sort of, you know, um, uh, context for questioning. What I will do, because we are um, practically out of time, uh, but we do have a few questions from the audience, I will leave my questions for tomorrow. 
I want to remind actually all our um, good audience who are persevered with us for the last three days um, that tomorrow we culminate our uh, presentations in a roundtable discussion with all the presenters. And so if, I, if you've sent me any questions that I have not gotten to, I will make sure to include them in tomorrow's um, discussion. And so feel free to continue to send questions uh, regardless. So for today, um, in the few minutes we have extra, and I'm going to take five more minutes extra over time um, to just sort of uh, uh, look into a couple of these questions. I have um, a question for you, Sarah, from, uh, from the audience um, that reads, I am intrigued by your discussion of gastro diplomacy. Could you say more about this and point viewers towards books on the topic? I actually have a number of other questions in relation to this for you, but I will keep my questions to tomorrow. But do you, um, would you like to elaborate a little bit on the concept? Um, well, that's a very interesting question. And it's not one that I feel I can do a great deal of justice to um, in a couple of minutes. Um, what I will do is I, I'd like to go back to my paper and if it's okay, I'd like to come back to you, Professor Shabut, tomorrow um, and come forward with a few suggestions. There isn't anything on the top of my head immediately, but I, I think it's a really fantastic um, it's a really fantastic thing to bring into a very, very large topic. I mean, food and healing and, and war and Michael's work, these are all huge topics. Um, and there was something very beautiful, I think, about gastro diplomacy, whereby, you know, Michael, um, Michael Rakowitz is, is giving us some very hard hitting messages about the most um, so sort of heart rending subjects and to do it through a medium of like uh, food, something to be ingested um, and in terms of diplomacy, I just thought that was very interesting. Um, I realize I've sort of glossed over a hard answer there, but I would like to come back to that tomorrow. That, that uh, yes, that would be fine. That, you know, we'll have more time to discuss it. Um, and since, you know, um, food is a very important uh, part of um, Rakowitz's sort of interventions, you know, I'm sure we will engage with this more. But so a follow-up question that you may um, want to either address or also add to your contemplation is, so it would be interesting to reflect on the impact of the social distancing and isolation required by the pandemic yeah. in artworks involving culinary uh, interventions. This seems spe especially important given the relation to healing that cooking and eating together has um, in many cultures. So, um, you know, that is definitely a topic or, a, a, you know, an issue worth uh, contemplating as the pandemic has dominated time and you know i don't need to tell you about it we're we're in different places in the world because of that so coming together and celebrating and doing things are very much compromised at the moment i agree that's actually a fantastic point and one that i I'd, I'd very like uh, very much like to come back to tomorrow um yeah in in terms of social distancing and the proximity and um you know food is so fantastic because it gives us this you know, it straddles the, the the most private and most intimate, but also the most public, you know, and to have a government sort of state mandated um, intervention on who eats what with where in what context and what distance, yes. you know, in, in terms of feeding, it's, yeah, I think it's very interesting. So, yeah. okay. yes. And I mean, you know, it would be definitely also worth looking into, you know, the idea of food and eating together as a, a shared Arab experience. So we will, we'll come back to these topics tomorrow. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. Amalia, um, a question for you from the audience. What's the relation between physical objects and written text in Michael's work as you reflect on concepts of memory and history and, and the image? Um, do you like to say a few words on that? Yeah, it's, it's really an interesting question because, um, um, for example, in The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, you can see many different artifacts or monuments, the reconstruction of monuments. And 
they themselves uh, are expression of history for themselves because they um, tell us about the regions. <laughs> so, and it is really important to consider the translation of Rakowitz of them because uh, through um, his vision, we perceive a different meanings of them and we uh, can um, um, change our memory of them and so for that our awareness about the present change mm -hmm. so it is really um, a topic that really interested me a lot of Rakowitz's work. Thank you and um, again you know these are uh, questions that um, will be I assume, you know, in, in various forms um, engaged uh, with tomorrow. So um, um, without, you know, taking much longer time from everyone's time, I know we all have Zoom fatigue as this new concept has um, uh, evolved in this culture. So I will um, end today's um, uh, session and I look forward to seeing all of our great presenters for, you know, the, they, they've all presented excellent works, which, you know, as I said, open up a whole sort of um, uh, context of questions and, and topics of discussions that we will be engaging with tomorrow. Um, in our, during our round table. So please, uh, to all our audience, hope to see you there tomorrow. And I hope to get your questions as well as, um, you know, the, the speakers, if you have questions for each other, that will be also great to, to um, um, include. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.